now it's my great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Craig Reeder of Mayo, Arizona. Dr. Reeder will give us a map of current treatment options for WM, so look at his bio, get out his slides, get out your glossary, and settle back to learn from one of our leading experts in the world. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Wonderful to see such a big group here. So I have to be uh, honest up front, let you know that I had a very short trip to get here. I didn't have to come. Uh, it took me about 20 minutes. But uh, anyway, I'm glad to be here, and I'm honored to uh, present to you today. I was asked to talk to you about the current treatment options for Waldenstrom. And I'm not going to go through some of the research stuff that's currently going on. I think you're going to have a separate talk about the clinical trials that are ongoing and even some specific things about certain drugs. So we're going to mainly focus on what the kind of the current standard treatment options are for newly diagnosed and for um, relapsed Walden's. So the objectives here are to review the indications for therapy realizing that some patients di diagnosed can be observed for a long time, have you already heard about this morning. Understand the different types of drugs, the different classes of drugs that are active and currently being used in Waldenstrom's. I want you to be aware of some of the potential side effects of these drugs. That's important when we uh, think about what regimen we're gonna pick for a patient. Um, we'll talk about, again, the options for upfront therapy and then how we look at relapsed disease and then uh, briefly just discuss the role of stem cell transplantation. The first thing I want to point out is that we see a lot of patients with IgM monoclonal gammopathies, and we have to realize that not everyone that has a monoclonal IgM uh, protein in their blood has Waldenstrom. There are rare patients that have actually multiple myeloma that secretes an IgM molecule. And then there are, of course, patients that have monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance that have very small protein um, very low-level plasma cells and, and lymphocytes in the bone marrow that really behave like uh, other monoclonal gammopathies without any underlying lymphoma. So the first question um, is not what treatment to have, but whether or not treatment is needed. And I think that's the most important uh, thing first to consider when we see a patient with uh, Waldenstrom. The second most important thing is then what treatment to use uh, either up front or at relapse. And it's also important to know that there's no specific number of the IgM, whether it's, you know, three grams or five grams, that says you have to start therapy. There's no good correlation. We know that patients tend to have higher, may have higher tumor burden, but that in itself is not an indication to start therapy. Conversely, some patients that need therapy have very small monoclonal spikes in their blood. They may only have uh, half a gram or one gram, may have no hyperviscosity, but have extensive bone marrow infiltration, have low blood counts, or have constitutional symptoms, or big lymph nodes that need therapy. So the IgM in itself is not a trigger to start therapy. And the other thing that's important to realize is that, as you've already heard, we've made a lot of progress in development of new drugs that are working in Waldenstrom's patients are living longer, and each year we have new treatment options. And if, if you don't need treatment, you know, that potential to have a new treatment in two years or five years that is even going to be less toxic and more effective than what we have right now behooves us to think about delaying th therapy until therapy is really needed. So in this slide, and again, you have copies, you should have copies of all these uh, to look through, but these are uh, well-established uh, indications for starting therapy. Um, fevers, drenching night sweats, weight loss, profound fatigue. So hyperviscosity syndrome we'll talk about briefly. That's an indication for therapy. Lymphadenopathy, the progressive enlargement of the lymph nodes. Um, enlargement of the liver, the spleen, that's causing symptoms. Um, neuropathy is an indication of start therapy. And then there are patients that have cryoglobulinemia or, Walden, or um, amyloidosis that's related to Waldenstrom. Those things are also are indications of start therapy. And as far as blood counts go, we look at the hemoglobin. Hemoglobin of, you know, under 10 certainly should be considered for therapy. Platelet counts under 100,000. Uh, all indications to think about starting therapy. 
So other considerations before we actually start a regimen are, uh, first of all, confirm that there is a need to treat. Uh, should, should it be observed for a little bit or should you get started on therapy quickly? We also want to think about if the patient might be a candidate for stem cell transplantation in the future, then there are certain drugs that we don't want to use up front because some of the treatments that are available now can damage the stem cells and make it very difficult to do a stem cell collection and go on to transplant. Are there other medical issues that might uh, point us uh, towards one treatment regimen versus another? Is there neuropathy at presentation, which is a very common uh, symptom in Waldenstrom? So there may be drugs we may not want to use if there's an underlying neuropathy. Is there heart disease? Are there signs of heart failure? Is there diabetes? All those things have to be considered when we think about starting a treatment regimen. And then how urgent is it to start treatment. If someone comes in with hyperviscosity, that's an emergency, uh, we have to treat that. And so that's something we wanna treat aggressively and we may wanna use a treatment regimen that works very quickly, very rapidly. Now talking about hyperviscosity, this is a cartoon that's showing what the IgM molecule looks like in the blood. It's actually five molecules that are joined together and that forms a very large, hence macroglobulin in the blood. And it's primarily in the bloodstream and not in the other tissues. It doesn't really leave the bloodstream. And this large molecule then causes the blood to become very thick, viscous. And when there's a large amount of it, that's what causes the hyperviscosity problem. It also can be, of course, associated with amyloidosis, neuropathy, and other things. But hyperviscosity is, is something that's one of the kind of the medical emergencies that we will occasionally see. And typically it's associated with Waldenstrom macroglobinemia, but occasionally a patient with, with um, multiple myeloma who has IgM. Uh, I actually have a patient right now who is requiring plasmapheresis who has IgM myeloma because of hyperviscosity. And sometimes with IgA proteins you can get high viscosity levels. But about 30% of the patients with Waldenstrom's can have hyperviscosity symptoms. And those are neurologic symptoms, confusion, dizziness, blurry vision, double vision. Some patients can present with a stroke-like condition and paralysis. Uh, heart failure is a very common symptom. And then another one is neuronasal bleeding. So bleeding from mucosal surface, like from the nose, the mouth, uh, all signs of high viscosity. Typically, when patients have symptoms from high viscosity, the blood viscosity, as we measure it, is above four. It's unusual to see symptoms with viscosities less than that. So when the monoclonal protein in the blood gets up to about 4,000 milligrams, four grams, the M spike is four, we want to be sure to check a viscosity level to get an idea of where that is. So treatment of hyperviscosity syndrome is to use plasmapheresis. And this is a, a technique done by the uh, laboratory medicine people We're using a machine that actually will pull the plasma out of the blood and then return the blood back to the patient, usually with some uh, normal saline or normal plasma uh, to replace the plasma that had all the IgM in. It's very effective to lower the IgM level. Sometimes one treatment uh, can lower it adequately to to reduce the risk of the hyperviscosity. Sometimes you have to have two treatments, but it's a very effective procedure. The problem is that isn't all that you have to do. That'll lower it temporarily, but it's a very temporary effect. You still have to then treat the underlying Waldenstrom, the lymphoma that's making the protein. So just the apheresis, plasmapheresis by itself is not adequate. You have to start some therapy to get the production to go down. So we're gonna talk about treatment and I'll mention some terms about how we gauge response to therapy. So CR, that means a complete response. And that, by definition, the monoclonal protein has disappeared from the blood completely. The lymph nodes are normal. The bone marrow shows no sign of any lymphoplasmacytic lymphoma. VGPR means very good partial remission. So there's still a little bit left over but the IgM drop has been over 90%, so a very good partial response to therapy. PR means partial response, more than 50% drop in the IgM. 
MR, minor response, we still think that's beneficial. And so when we talk about overall response in Waldenstrom, we include minor response, partial response, complete response, so forth. So what are the drug classes that are currently being used in Waldenstrom's? First, the monoclonal antibodies, and I think they have to be foremost because virtually monoclonal antibodies are included in most, key, most regimens that we use uh, nowadays. And, and the main drug, of course, is rituximab or rituxin. And this is an antibody that targets an, a marker on the lymphocyte called CD20, and it's specific for that marker. CD20 is present on the Waldenstrom cells. Um, and it's also present on other B cells. Other normal lymphocytes can have that expression. So when we use a monoclonal antibody, it targets the malignant cell, but it also can target some normal cells. And that can lead to a decrease not only in the IgM, but also in the normal production of immunoglobulins. So one of the side effects of long-term use of rituxan is a low gamma globulin level. Sometimes that'll lead to problems with infection. Now, there are two other monoclonal antibodies that target the same thing. There's ofatumumab and obinutuzumab. Um, I didn't put the brand names up there, but they're not used quite as often as rituxan, but they do work. Um, they all have pretty much the same kinds of side effects, um, but they all can be combined with other, other drugs. Alkylators. Alkylating agents are very old chemotherapy drugs. This is what we consider old chemo. These are derived from uh, nitrogen mustard, the mustard gases used back in World War I. Um, that's where these compounds came from. And these are, these are toxic drugs. They're very good drugs to treat lymphoma. They're very active, but they do have side effects. And we'll talk about some of those side effects. But cytoxin is a very common, or cyclophosphamide, commonly used. Uh, chlorambucil is, is a much older drug, uh, not used as often anymore, but but it does have activity. And then bendamustine, which is actually not that new a drug, but new to North America. It was used for many years in uh, Eastern Europe where it was developed, and used to treat many kinds of cancers. But that's newer to us here, and it turns out to be a very, very active drug in Wallenstrom. And the next group of drugs are the proteasome inhibitors. And these are, we call these novel agents. These aren't the typical chemotherapy drugs. They don't damage DNA. Bortezomib was the first drug that was approved for multiple myeloma. This is now being used quite a bit in Waldenstrom. Carfilzomib is a second generation proteasome inhibitor. Uh, it's also very, very active and has data now in Waldenstrom. Ixazomib, an, another proteasome inhibitor that's actually taken by a mouth, which is unique, the first oral proteasome inhibitor. And then oprosomib, which is not approved. Uh, I'm not going to say much more about oprosomib, uh, but it is a proteasome inhibitor which has activity. Steroids, uh, corticosteroids. Um, these aren't chemotherapy drugs per se, but they're active in many kinds of lymphoma, including Waldenstrom's. Um, glucocorticoids or corticosteroids kill lymphocytes, and that's one of the ways they help treat uh, lymphoma and Waldenstrom's. The two common ones are prednisone, uh, again taken by mouth, and dexamethasone, which can either be taken by mouth or can be given intravenously. And these do have uh, side effects of, you know, weight gain and uh, puffy face. It can raise blood sugar and uh, cause osteoporosis if they're used for long periods of time. But if you use them sparingly in conjunction with the other agents, they can be very uh, effective in adding to the response. The next group of drug is the purine nucleoside analogs, fludarabine. The drug's been around quite a while and actually is a very active drug in Waldenstrom and other lymphomas. It's commonly used to treat leukemia, which is a related condition, chronic lymphatic leukemia. Um, Cladribine is another purine nucleoside, probably not used as often, uh, but also activity in Waldenstrom, and then penistatin. Uh, these are typically given intravenously. Uh, uh, cladribine can be given as a subcutaneous injection, but uh, typically it's uh, given IV. 
And the last group of drugs we'll be talking about are the kinase inhibitors. And this includes ibrutinib, uh, which is a very novel drug. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. Idelalisib, which is another kinase inhibitor, and everolimus. And these drugs are, are unique in that they target specific enzymes that are involved in the, the, the growth and the development of the malignant cell. And so if we shut off that particular enzyme, it shuts off the growth pathway and the cells can die. So it's more of a targeted therapy, a different kind of a target than the monoclonal antibody is, which targets the surface of the cell. This targets the machinery inside the lymphocyte and shuts it off, makes it die. So a little bit more about the monoclonal antibody theory. Again, rituximab is kind of the, the main drug we use these days. It targets the CD20 antigen, which is on the surface of the cell. And many of the Waldenstrom cells are CD20 positive. Some aren't. Some are CD19 only. And therefore, this doesn't necessarily target every cell. Ofatumumab and obinutuzumab are newer generations, uh, but they target the same thing, basically. And as a single agent, there is activity in Waldenstrom, but it tends to be rather slow. I remember one of the first trials we did years ago, I think Dr. Gertz uh, had a trial in Rochester where we used single agent rituximab to treat Waldenstrom's, and the response rates weren't as, as encouraging as we had hoped uh, when we looked at responses at three months, but when we looked at six months, they had improved. So it just shows that the response can be ongoing, and these drugs stay in your blood for quite a while. But nowadays, we have therapy that's much more effective, and so typically, we wouldn't use the monoclonal antibodies by themselves. Usually, we combine them with other drugs. Side effects of monoclonal antibodies are mainly to do with the infusion reaction. So these are given intravenously, and often we have to pre-medicate with Tylenol and Benadryl because it can cause an allergic reaction. And those symptoms commonly are chills, fevers, shakes, Sometimes a skin rash, hives. Rarely you can get a serious reaction, like a drop in the blood pressure uh, or swelling of the throat or lips. I've only seen that once, and I've been using rituximab for over 20 years. Long-term use of rituximab can cause low gamma globulin levels. And again, sometimes that can lead to increased risk of infection. One thing that's important to know in Waldenstrom, if if rituximab is used as a single agent, there's a significant risk of the IgM level going up. That's called the IgM flare. Now, if it's combined with other chemotherapy, it's not like, as likely to happen. But if someone has a high, relatively high IgM level, it's prudent to think about preventing that IgM flare. Because if you get a flare and it gets high enough, you can get hyperviscosity syndrome. So if you start off with a high IgM, you may want to think about doing plasmapheresis first before starting just the rituximab. So the alkylating, alkylating agents, clarambucil again is a, one of the old uh, chemotherapy drugs. It's taken by mouth, which is kind of convenient. It's been used to treat a lot of different kinds of lymphoma, uh, Hodgkin and non-Hodgkin lymphoma. Uh, it can be combined with rituximab, can combine it with obinutuzumab, the other antibody. Uh, it can cause some slight nausea. It can lower the blood counts, so it, it suppresses the bone marrow a little bit, so you have to watch that. And prolonged use of the alkaline agents, and I'm talking about chlorambucil, cyclophosphamide. These alkylating agents, if they're used for long periods of time, meaning not just a few months, but years, can damage the bone marrow permanently. Um, and there is an increased risk of leukemia with prolonged use of alkylating agents. Cyclophosphamide is another alkylating agent. Um, this can be given by mouth or intravenously, though it's a very practical drug. Again, very active in many lymphomas. It's combined with rituximab. It's combined with other drugs. And it becomes uh, kind of a, one of the standard drugs in many of the combinations we use, like DRC. We'll talk about that regimen, dexamethasone, rituximab, cyclophosphamide. Um, RCVP, which is cyclophosphamide, vincristin, and prednisone. 
are CHOP, cyclophosphamide, adriamycin, vincristin, prednisone. All these regimens have been uh, very effective treatments in Waldenstrom. Now there's some that we don't use as much anymore. Our CHOP's kind of fallen by the wayside. RCVP has two because of some of the side effects that we see. All the alkaline agents, again, can cause low blood counts. Cytoxin can cause hair loss, um, nausea, vomiting. Uh, and again, prolonged use of the alkylating agents can damage the bone marrow. Now, bendamustine, I mentioned, is uh, relatively new to uh, United States, North America, but it's a drug that's been around for quite a long time. It's a little different than the other alkylating agents. It's typically thought to have uh, different mechanisms of action. It still can damage the, the DNA, uh, but it may have some effect more like fludarabine in addition. So we call it a bifunctional agent. It has two different functions. And this was approved for lymphoma in 2008 in this country. It can treat non-Hodgkin lymphoma. It's used to treat chronic leukemia. And these are all, of course, cousin diseases to Waldenstrom's. It's relatively easy to give. Uh, it's given over 15 to 30 minutes, but it is intravenous. It's given typically two days in a row, so day one, day two, and then you're off for three weeks, and then a, a month after starting, you start again. So that would be one cycle of therapy. Typically, we combine it with rituximab, so the BR regimen, bendamustine and rituximab, is a very good regimen, very active regimen, uh, commonly used for Waldenstrom now and for other low-grade lymphomas. In general, it's tolerated a little bit better than regimens like CHOP, and I'll show you some data about that. It can cause a rash, can cause some fever, fatigue, low blood counts, headache, diarrhea. We don't tend to see any hair loss, and we don't see neuropathy. So that's the plus to this drug. And we'll talk about the proteasome inhibitors, mainly bortezomib, because it's the one that's been looked at most in Waldenstrom. And the other name for bortezomib is Velcade. That's probably the term you've, you've heard of most. This was the first proteasome inhibitor, kind of what, one of the novel agents. And again, it's approved for multiple myeloma, um, but it has very good activity in Waldenstrom. It can be given intravenously or as a shot under the skin. It can be given twice a week or once a week. But all the data now suggests that if you give it under the skin and if you give it just once a week, you have equal effects, but much less in the way of side effects. Intravenous, twice weekly, bortezomib is a pretty high risk of developing, of causing peripheral neuropathy. And sometimes the neuropathy gets better if the drug is stopped, but it doesn't always get better. And occasionally the neuropathy can be painful. It also can lower the platelet counts. It can cause some diarrhea. Uh, fatigue is common. But it can be combined with other drugs. And we'll talk about some of the regimens that combine Velcade or bortezomib. A newer generation proteasome inhibitor is carfilzomib. The brand name is Kyprolis. This is kind of a second generation drug. It's a little more potent uh, than bortezomib, but it has to be given in the vein. You can't give it sub-Q. The, the other plus is that it doesn't cause much neuropathy. Um, it's typically given two days per week, so it'd be like a Monday and Tuesday, and then Monday and Tuesday of the next week, and sometimes even a third week. So it's not as easy as giving once a week of LK. It has been used in Waldenstrom, and this uh, showed you this little regimen here with uh, rituxan, dexamethasone, carfilzomib, uh, have very good response rates, 87% uh, responded to this. Uh, so it certainly has activity in Waldenstrom's. The next class of drugs I mentioned was the perinucleoside analogs, and the drug that's been looked at most is, is fludarabine. Um, fludarabine is, is a very standard drug for chronic lymphatic leukemia. It's used in other low-grade lymphomas. It's intravenous. It is, uh, in Europe, they actually have an oral form of fludarabine, but it's not available here. It's typically given for five days. By I, each day, you come in five days in a row, and then we repeat that a month later. So one cycle would be five days, and then a second cycle a month later. 
And typically that's combined with rituxan or with cyclophosphamide. There's cytoxin again. So the FCR regimen, which is a standard treatment for chronic leukemia, is very active in Waldenstrom's. FR by itself is very active in Waldenstrom's. Um, it can cause some nausea, fatigue, low blood counts. It's very immune suppressing. So it's very potent in killing off the lymphocytes and suppressing the immune system. And so there's risk of infection and it can damage the stem cells. So again, if we think someone might be a candidate to have a stem cell transplant where we wanna collect their stem cells before they have a lot of therapy, we don't wanna use a lot of fludarabine up front. We also know that there's a risk of leukemia and myelodysplastic syndrome in patients treated with fludarabine. And I think we're seeing much less use of fludarabine, especially in combination with cytoxin, because of that long-term risk of leukemia and MDS, which is basically bone marrow failure. Cladribine, another purine nucleoside, again, typically given IV, again, for five days. This can be combined also with cytoxin, with toxin. Um, similar side effects, rash, maybe a little bit more common, um, but some same potential long-term risk. Now, the, the kinase inhibitor drugs. Ibrutinib is the, has to be on the top of the list. It's a remarkable drug. This drug was approved for relapsed mantle cell lymphoma in 2013, then for chronic leukemia in 2014, and then approved for Waldenstrom's in 2015. A little over two years ago, approved for relapsed and upfront therapy of Waldenstrom's. Pretty remarkable. I think it's the only drug approved for Waldenstrom's. Pretty remarkable. It is a remarkable drug. Um, we'll talk about it. Here's one of the first trials with Ibrutinib. And this said uh, phase two trial, 63 patients showed a response rate of about 60%, 61%. And patients, to take a brutinib, you take it daily, you just stay on it until you progress or until you have side effects. But basically it's ongoing therapy. So it looked very promising. We also know that patients that have MYD88 mutation have a better chance of responding to the drug than those that don't have the mutation. And this is from an article that Dr. Treon published a few years ago in New England Journal. It doesn't mean it won't work. Uh, it still can work, but. So some of the side effects of abrutinib, uh, diarrhea, nausea, skin rash, fatigue, muscle spasms, mouth sores, not too bad. There are occasionally serious reactions. Low blood counts occasionally occur. Patients do have a risk of getting atrial fibrillation. And there's a bleeding risk. We're not really sure why that is. It probably has some effect on the platelet function uh, in the blood. Platelets are an important part of the coagulation, the hemostatic system. And so there's some risk of bleeding. That has to be kept in mind if someone already has a bleeding risk or if they're on an anticoagulant, then you have to be concerned about aggravating that risk. But the response rate was about 70% in Waldenstrom's, which is pretty promising for an oral drug. Now, one issue with Zydelig is it tends to have a little bit more in the way of side effects than uh, ibrutinib. Um, some patients can have severe uh, inflammation in the GI tract, diarrhea, colitis, and a lot of other itises like pneumonitis, which is like pneumonia, and hypophysitis, which is inflammation of the part of the brain but it's a promising drug. So another drug is Everolimus, uh, Affinitor. This is a drug we've actually studied for a long, long time at Mayo. Uh, uh, we had trials looking at various kinds of lymphomas. Um, Dr. Witzig, I think, headed most of these trials up. And Dr. Gobriel did some studies with this drug also. And we looked at the Waldenstrom population, and it actually has pretty good response rates of about 50%. It's an oral agent, so it's very easy to take. Um, there are some side effects, though. Some patients can get mouth sores, stomatitis, diarrhea can occur, and occasionally patients can get some inflammation in the lung, pneumonia, pneumonitis again, but it is an active drug. Uh, 
So combination therapies, we talked about combining rituxan with a lot of things, and I just listed some of the things that are commonly done. Rituxan has been combined with thalidomide. I'm not going to talk about thalidomide. I don't like that drug. Bendamustine, RB or BR, it's a good regimen. Uh, rituxan and bortezomib or Velcade. Then, of course, the combinations with cytoxin, which is RCVP, RCP, DRC, R-CHOP, R-CHOP. Our fludarabine, our cladibine. So rituxan gets plugged onto just about everything we do these days, and it improves the outcome. So we'll go through some of these combination regimens, the common ones that we're using now. And the first one I'll talk about is the DRC regimen. And this regimen actually was, this paper was published uh, 10 years ago now by Demopolis. And it's a relatively simple treatment where you give dexamethasone, IV, one dose, and then you give rituxan, same day. And then for uh, the next five days, you take cytoxin by mouth in a low dose twice a day for five days, and you repeat it every three weeks. It's pretty simple, pretty easy, tolerated drug. You can see in the bottom right corner, three, grade three, four adverse effects were only seen in 15% of patients, so pretty easy. And response rates were pretty good, about 83% response rates. Pretty good. Overall survival at two years, 81%. Pretty good. So this regimen is still being used. I think this is a reasonable approach for upfront therapy or for relapse therapy. Um, there may be treatments that have better long-term outcome as far as staying in remission longer, but this is a very easy regimen with very few side effects. I'm going to talk about bendamustine and rituxan, because this is all, another very good regimen, commonly used up front now. And this was actually a trial looking at bendamustine and rituxan compared to RCHOP. And this was done for a variety of low-grade lymphomas, but it included Waldenstrom macroglobulinemia. So it was a randomized trial. This is about the only randomized trial I know of in Waldenstrom other lymphomas, but included Waldenstrom's. So they're randomized one-to-one. -one. This group got RCHOP, this group got bendamustine and rituximab. And that's the, that was the STILL trial. For upfront patients, there were 41 Waldenstrom patients. Response rates in both arms were very good, 95% response rate, very, very good. But the key thing was the progression-free survival was much longer with bendamustine and rituxan. That means patients stayed in remission much longer if they were treated with bendamustine compared to RCHOP. And the other thing is much less toxic. RCHOP causes hair loss, peripheral neuropathy, infection risk, all those were much less, and again, no hair loss with bendamustine. So there are ongoing trials. There's, I think, a trial, I don't know if it's been completed yet, using BR with or without maintenance rituxan. So we'll have to see what that shows. So this was a trial looking at the same regimen, BR, bendamustine rituxan, for relapsed Waldenstrom's. Same regimen, you get rituxan on day one, bendamustine's day one, day two, and then you repeat that every four weeks for up to six cycles of therapy. Response rates in the relapse setting, 80%. Very good. Now we'll talk about another combination, but I don't want you to get confused. This is BDR, but the B here is bortezomib. It's not bendamustine. And this was uh, the first, uh, I think one of the first combinations where they used the Velcade, uh, uh, bortezomib, uh, along with the dexamethasone and rituxan in Waldenstrom's. And this was published in Blood and then in uh, uh, Clinical Oncology a number of years ago. Um, it was a small study, only 23 patients were on the study. The bortezomib was given IV twice a week, day one, day four, eight, and 11, so twice a week for two weeks, along with the rituxan, and very high response rates. You can see overall response rates, 94%. Survival, 95% at five years. Progression-free survival, pretty good. Half, over half were still in remission five years later. The problem was the toxicity. Neuropathy occurred in almost 70% of patients. 
60% of the patients actually discontinued the bortezomib because of the side effects. So needed to do something a little less toxic. Very active and active, th this shows you the drop in the M-spike. This is the average M-spike drop with each cycle of therapy. You can see after the first basically two cycles of therapy, it's less than half of where it started. So it's a very active regimen and drops the M very quickly. So another study was done with the same combination. This is bortezomib, dexamethasone, rituximab. But after the bortezomib was given twice a week for just one week and then went to weekly, once a week only, and was much less toxicity uh, and still very good response rates, 85% response rates, um, good progression-free survival, good overall survival. And this combination, it doesn't have any alkylating agent. There's no bendamustine. There's no cytoxin. It's, quote, chemotherapy-free, which is, a, of course, a plus. We think, you know, if you don't have to have chemo, it's a good thing. Uh, and the responses last a long time. And the other thing I'll point out is that it was a fixed duration. You had six cycles, and you were done. That was it. Uh, one of the downsides to some of the other drugs like the kinase inhibitors, you go on the drug, you stay on it forever until you progress or you have side effects. So this is a fixed duration treatment, you're done, which is nice. Those just show kind of survival rates. I'll just point out the bottom graph, the red curve at the top looks very, very good based on stage. So your risk stage, low risk, do very, very good with this treatment. Now some other combinations with the proteasome inhibitor, bortezomib. And this is a combination with cytoxin, cyclophosphamide and dexamethasone. Uh, the regimen we've used uh, for multiple myeloma, related disease, which is very active. And this showed very good response, 93% response rate, very small study, but Obviously, you can combine it with other things. This is a similar trial, and this was a very small study, a uh, small number of patients, but BCR, same drugs, compared it to FCR, to fludarabine cytoxin rituxin. Response rates were very good in both arms, uh, but less toxic with the bortezomib arm compared to fludarabine. A little bit more now about fludarabine rituxin, because this was used uh, uh, I think quite a bit, uh, a decade ago and maybe 15 years ago. Um, it's a very active regimen, the rituxin, um, again, combined with fludarabine, which is given IV over five days, and then you repeat it monthly. Response rates, you can see at the bottom, about 95% response rate, uh, and not bad duration of response, uh, 51 months the median time to progression. The problem with it, in the right lower corner, you see the grade three adverse uh, events. The very bottom, 7% developed acute leukemia or myelodysplastic syndrome. So again, you have to caution about using that up front. If someone you expect them to live a long time with all the new drugs, we're seeing people live longer and longer. You don't want them to get acute leukemia in five years or eight years. So have to use caution. Fludarabine and cladribine still considerations for salvage therapy, of course. Just one uh, note about maintenance therapy. So maintenance therapy uh, usually implies the use of rituxin, the monoclonal antibody, because it's so easy to give. And there's a lot of data looking at low-grade lymphomas with rituxin maintenance, where it's given once every two months for two years or every three months for two years. And most of the data in other low-grade lymphomas suggest that progression-free survival is improved if you're on maintenance. So you stay in remission longer. But there's not as much data as to say you actually live longer. And there can be downsides to maintenance therapy. And currently, there's just not enough data in Waldenstrom for us to suggest that be routine uh, for everybody that's, you know, finished their therapy. Certainly can be considered, but. So I've listed a lot of the different drugs, the regimens here. 
overall response rates, you can see they vary from 50% with rituxan alone to as high as 95% with fludarabine, BCR, BR, 95%. Um, so it's kind of hard to make a decision on what to do. There's very little data with randomized trials comparing these different regimens. So it's kind of hard to know what to do. And this is my, this is my map of confusion. How do you pick a regimen? You know, what, you know, if you had good randomized data to look at, it would make it much easier, but we don't. So at Mayo Clinic, we have set up some consensus guidelines about what we think is a reasonable approach to treating patients with Waldenstrom's, and we, we published this. Dr. Kapoor just published the, the recent update in GEM Oncology, I think, in January. And these little diagrams you have, you can look at later, but I think uh, the three boxes, the first box, of course, is a IgM monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significant patient or an asymptomatic Waldenstrom with absolutely no symptoms or blood counts are fine. Uh, those patients should be observed. We don't have any data suggesting that treating up front is gonna change long-term outcome. And when you start treatment, you're adding expense, potential side effects. The middle group is a maybe kind of need to treat a little bit anemic or a patient might have neuropathy or hemolytic anemia. And I think considerations would be for that group to have rituximab, keeping in mind that you have to worry about an IgM flare, uh, but that'd be a consideration. Or you could consider a, an easy regimen like the DRC regimen. In the third group of the patients that obviously need treatment, they may come in with hyperviscosity, big lymph nodes, big uncomfortable spleen, um, quite anemic. Those patients need to be treated. And of course, if they have hyperviscosity syndrome, they should be plasma phoresed, and then also started on an induction regimen. And our, our number one pick is bendamustine rituximab. And the main reason is that we don't use the bortezomib up front is because the high incidence of neuropathy uh, using the drug and patients with Waldenstrom's often walk in the door and they have neuropathy to start with. And so we think that bendamustine is probably a, maybe a safer way to start, um, but I think the BDR regimen with Velcate would certainly be an option. So we typically would treat for four to six cycles with bendamustine rituximab. Um, and then we don't typically recommend maintenance rituxan because we just don't have enough data yet. Maybe, maybe the data will show up and say, yeah, everybody ought to be on maintenance. And the other thing just to consider, if someone is relatively young, I don't know what age that is anymore as I get older, I can't figure it out. Um, but if you think somebody's in good health and might be a potential candidate to have an auto transplant as part of their treatment, then you want to collect some stem cells before you have a lot of therapy. If you wait till they've had a second salvage therapy or a third salvage therapy, well, by then the bone marrow is going to be beat up. You may have trouble collecting stem cells. And so it's nice to think about someone's in their first remission, their blood counts are great, their bone marrow is still healthy, collect some stem cells, put them in the freezer. They can sit in the freezer for years, and then you can use the transplant as a treatment option uh, five years later, seven years later. How do we approach salvage therapy? Well, the same drugs we used up front, those same regimens can be used in the relapse setting. If someone has had a remission that's lasted three or four or five years, you can go back and use the same drugs again. Now, obviously, if somebody comes back five years later, but now they've got a neuropathy, then you may not want to be using bortezomib. You may want to go to the other regimens. If someone has had less than a three-year duration of remission, then you want to switch. If they started with BR, then maybe you want to go to Velcade, dexamethasone, rituximab, or to DRC. You want to do something different. Or to a brutinib. We like a brutinib, and a brutinib, I think, in our minds, probably best as a second-line therapy rather than up front, because we don't have that long-term data and we don't want to keep taking it for five years and 
So I just basically said what this next slide shows. We, we avoid the velcade up front because of neuropathy. Um, we don't use a brutin up front because of the lack of long-term data. Um, we don't like purine nucleosides up front if we think, especially if someone's gonna live a long time, um, we want a healthy bone marrow, we don't want them to get acute leukemia. And again, you can retreat with the same regimen if they've had a nice remission, three years plus. And then we don't want to forget about clinical trials. I think at any of these time points, newly diagnosed, uh, relapse, second relapse, we want to see if there's a clinical trial. Because some of these new drugs, you know, like the first trials with a brutinib, could have been on a brutinib, it would have been wonderful. And you get on a clinical trial, the drugs are often free, which is another plus. What's the role of stem cell transplantation in Walden's trauma? And why do we consider autotransplant? I'm not going to talk really much about allotransplant, but autotransplant, where you use your own stem cells to get hydrotherapy, we give you back your own stem cells to rebuild the bone marrow. Well, we know the current therapy for Walden's trauma is not curative. We know that repeated use of the alkylator drugs or the Drugs like fludarabine can damage the bone marrow, cause acute leukemia, so we don't want to keep doing that. The novel agents aren't without potential side effects. You know, a brutinib can cause side effects, idelalisib. Um, we know that it's a good treatment for other related diseases, so non-Hodgkin lymphoma. We can cure some patients with lymphoma by doing an autotransplant. Multiple myeloma, it's still a standard part of therapy for myeloma. And there is some data showing that patients transplanted can have a long duration of remission. Mortality with autotransplant is very low. It's about 5% mortality if you use your own stem cells. That's, I'm not going to talk about allo because allo transplant mortality is about 15 to 20%. That's those different stakes involved there. We're not going to go through this in any detail, but uh, these were a number of trials looking at results of autotransplant in, um, in Waldenstrom. Most of them, you can see the number of patients are very small, 10, 9, 13, 13. Small numbers, it's hard to make a lot of sense out of that. There was a retrospective review, and this was published uh, a number, a couple years ago, looking at outcomes for patients over a, uh, like a 15 year period of time from the European Bone Marrow Transplant Registry. And there were 600 patients that were transplanted. Now you can see the median age was 53. So it's a young group. So we're not transplanting people who are 75 years old with Waldstrom. And most of them were transplanted up front 19 months from uh, diagnosis. Mortality in their group was about 7% non-relapse mortality. But survival was pretty good. Five-year survival, 70, 65%. But look at the last line. If you were in your first remission and had a transplant, survival was 71% versus 63% of second. So we think about doing this. We don't want to wait till you've had three or four lines of therapy and then think about doing an auto-transplant. You're not going to have a good outcome. So we tend to want to do it at first relapse, maybe second relapse, if you do it. So autotransplant can produce deep responses and they can be durable responses. Mortality is low. Again, we avoid the purine nucleoside drugs in patients who are young. We think transplant might be an option. Then we don't, you wanna use fludarabine and cladribine up front. Think about collecting stem cells in first remission if you might be a transplant candidate. And again, those cells can sit in the freezer for years. And again, aloe, I'm gonna avoid. So another little cartoon, you're on the left here, you're diagnosed with Waldenstrom's, you're asymptomatic, and you're cruising along on the observation line. Watch, monitor. Then you get some symptoms, or you get anemic, you need treatment, and you drop down in BR, DRC, BDR, kind of the main upfront treatment options. Once you're done with treatment, you go back on observation. In the meantime, you think about getting your stem cells collected. But back on observation. You have a relapse. You think about treatment. Go back to the first-line therapy if you've had a good, long remission. 
If not, a brood nib, stem cell transplant, fludarabine. Summary, asymptomatic Waldenstrom, Waldenstrom can be observed. Symptomatic patients need to be treated to decrease the lymphoma burden. Benda rituxin is our initial pref preferred regimen, but bortezomib and rituxin dex is an option. DRC is an option if the tumor burden is very low. Hyperviscosity, we manage with plasmapheresis. Autotransplant should be a consideration as a treatment option for relapse disease. Abrutinib is a great drug, probably best as a second line drug for relapse disease. And maintenance therapy, we just don't have enough data yet, but it might be something to do in the future. Now last, this is my last slide, and I want to just impress you on the advances we've made in the last 30 years. You can see on the timeline along the bottom, these different colors are different age groups. The yellow line is 80 plus years survival for Waldenstrom. And you can see that all age groups have improved survival since the 1980s, in the 1990s, still improving. So we've come a long way, made a lot of progress. And I'll stop with that and be ready for questions at the mics. Dexamethasone is commonly used in a variety of combinations, but apparently not in rituxan plus bendamustine. My question is why? Doesn't need it. BR Good by answer. itself, BR by itself, 95% response rate. Why do you want to add DEX if you don't need it? Now sometimes a little DEX or a little steroid might be given with the rituxan if you're having like a lot of reactions from the infusion, but otherwise um, you don't need it. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, can you describe the stem th cell? Um, Taking the stem cells, how it does it? Does it take a long time? Is, is it like an operation? Where do they no, take no, them no. from? Is it done in your clinic? Uh, yes, quick and easy, relatively quick and easy. The stem cells are taken from the blood now. We don't do bone marrow harvesting, okay. per se. Mm -hmm. We use Nupagen, which stimulates the bone marrow to release stem cells. And after about four days, we can put a temporary catheter in the jugular vein, hook you up to the machine, the same kind of a machine that you use to treat, that you use for plasmapheresis, but we take out the cells, we give you back the rest of the blood, and then those cells, the mononuclear cells, are cryopreserved. So the whole thing can, you can do typically in about eight, nine, 10 days, and then you're done. So would it require coming to the clinic for eight, nine, 10 days in a row, or does it just be? You'd have to have the injection daily, and right. that would be done at the clinic. Right. And then typically you'd start the collection process on day five or six. Mm -hmm. If you collect in one day, you're done. Okay, I see. So it could be anywhere from six to eight days. And, and you would recommend that for someone 60 years old who has had rituxin one time, I mean, eight, eight uh, cycles of it or whatever you call Should it? Should be considered, providing there aren't any other health issues that might be. Uh, right, no, a healthy person. Otherwise, okay. Otherwise, thanks. healthy person should be a consideration. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Back over here, I think. Um, when bendamustine uh, first came out, I think we were, it was recommended that a dose of 120 milligrams per square meter was used, but could you comment on the current recommended dosing of bendamustine? Yeah, the current dosing would be 90 milligrams. Some people drop to 70 if there's been a lot of prior therapy, so if you're using it in the relapse setting, you may want to use 70 milligrams per meter squared. Not too many, I haven't seen 120 used for a long time. I think that was used initially, the very first studies in aggressive lymphomas, they used 120, but now it's pretty much 70 or 90. Thank you. Are, are the criteria for when to treat the same for relapse as for initial therapy? Yes. So you don't treat numbers, you treat symptoms when they recur? Correct, except if the numbers say your hemoglobin's nine and you're symptomatic, right. then you no, don't. I mean the IgM. Right. right. Correct. Yes. If you're asked to um, discontinue brutinib for a medical procedure, 
For 30 days, do you see a problem with that? For 30 days? It's kind of a long time to be off of brutinib. I think some patients can have, you know, certainly have progression uh, uh, after a brutinib um, if you're off that long. So you have to watch your numbers closely, I think. Would you then take labs periodically during that time? Yep. Uh, to follow up on the earlier question about stem cell therapy, um, two parts. One is why not consider banking stem cells uh, in the earliest phases of, of development before first treatment? And second is maybe you could comment a little bit on the, on the replacement process for stem cells. Um, I guess the question is when did collect the stem cells? In general, when we collect the stem cells, even though we do it from the blood, mm. We want to collect stem cells that we think uh, don't have a lot of contamination from mm. lymphoma. Um, collection might be a little bit harder if someone has a lot of Waldenstrom in the marrow. It may be difficult collecting enough cells. So typically we wouldn't do that until someone's been treated and their bone marrow kind of back to more normal. Um, in the assumption that after the first treatment, their, their numbers, their, their infiltration will be lower than in the early watch and wait stages. Correct. Okay. Correct. And as far as replacement of the stem cell process, that's also relatively easy. Now, autotransplant is something that's done in the hospital. The collection is outpatient, typically. Um, for Waldenstrom, the treatment would involve being admitted to the hospital and receiving some chemotherapy to kind of wipe out the bone marrow, and of course, in hopes of wiping out any residual Waldenstrom. And then that chemo typically would be over about six days. And then the follow following that, then we thawed the stem cells that brought to the patient's room and put in a water bath, and they're thawed. And then they're given right through an IV, like a little tiny blood transfusion. Interesting, and they just naturally take up residence back in the bone marrow. They find their way back. They know where to go. Cool. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Hi. Thank Hi. you for your presentation. You're welcome. First question is regarding a port. Uh, not having been treated yet, I've been told that it is recommended to have a port rather than continuous IVs when I start the uh, two-day-a-month, four-to-six cycles. Is that your recommendation as well? To have a port? I think uh, ports are uh, a real plus if you're hard to start an IV on. If you uh, are going to be on a regimen that requires very frequent treatments, if you're going to have IV treatments very frequently, then having a port would be easy. Um, I think a lot of people get by without ports for like bendamustine rituxan, kind of two days in a row, then they're done, come back a month later don't usually need a port for that. The other mm -hmm. options are like pick lines, which are external. Uh, they're easier to put in, they're easy to take out, but there's a little greater risk of having an infection in a pick line. Okay. So for Waldenstrom, you know, a lot of people get by without the need for a port. Okay, second question, a little bit more extensive. Uh, for those who may not be knowledgeable about this, my secondary issue is sarcoidosis, which is a, a result of the lymphoma, lymphoma in the lungs. So my question is, and we have discussed this, the treatment for the sarcoidosis is what is necessitating my need for the BR treatment um, versus just simply uh, prednisone. And I'm wondering if there's any study that has been done for those with sarcoidosis that I could do research on to understand a little bit more about the repercussions of simply going with prednisone versus a BR regimen. I don't know that there's a whole lot of data. I'm not a sarcoidosis expert, uh, and I know you've seen some experts in that field, and I think the point would be that patients can get a granulomatous lung reaction with underlying lymphoma, whether it's a separate disease or an unusual side effect from your Waldenstrom, uh, it would be very difficult to say. I think if the granulomatous lung problem is the main issue, that's where the tension needs to go, 
And if the lung doctors felt that the steroids had a very good chance of improving that, uh, and he needed no other indication for therapy, then the steroids are a reasonable <laughs> approach to start. If not, then I think you need to address the underlying Waldenstrop lymphoma. And I can't tell you if bendamustine or bortezomib have been used to treat sarcoid. Rituxan has, I believe. So Rituxan might be a potential uh, treatment for you. Thank you. You're welcome. In considering combination therapy, wouldn't rituxan and carvilzomib be a better option than rituxan and Valcade, since you would not have the risk of peripheral neuropathy? Rituxan and what was the Carvilzomib. Carfilzomib. Carfilzomib, yes. Mm -hmm. I think that would be a reasonable thing, and that there is some data, you know, combining those. Um, there's probably not enough data to say everybody ought to do that. And the downside to that is it's day one, day two, day eight, day nine, day fifth. It's twice a week for typically two or three weeks, uh, so it's not quite as practical as Velcade or Benamustine, but active drug. Hi. Um, so far, WM can't be cured. So um, what happens if someone, a patient, relapses after stem cells transplant? Where well, do we go then? Well, a stem cell transplant isn't a cure-all right. for this like disease. So patients do relapse after. I think the pluses of a stem cell transplant is that it, it's aggressive therapy and patients can get a long remission. So after relapse, I think you're back to the same thing. You think about some of these other regimens. Think about a brutinib, adelisib, everlimus. Um, three years from now, we'll have new drugs. Right. Okay. Yeah. Thank. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Reeder. Can we all give him a round of applause?